Welcome to the Third Era Skyrim, home of the true Nords. I am not getting fat. These furs are shrinking. Seen any elves? <laughs> ah! My teeth itch. You want something, friend? What was that about? <laughs> I take it you want something. Well, what is it? For those unaware, Skyrim Home of the Nords is an ongoing modding project with the goal of adding the province of Skyrim on Morrowind's engine. And if that sounds like something you might be interested in, you are in the right place. For today, we are going to have a closer look at a mod that, in my humble opinion, stands side by side with Tamriel Rebuilt. This video will serve only as an introduction, sort of a general overview. We won't go deep into analyzing particular quests or locations, as my plan is to have a whole series of lore videos set in Skyrim, similar to my Tamriel Rebuilt focused videos. And before we begin, there are a couple of things worth mentioning. Firstly, current playable landmass is limited only to a portion of Skyrim's western region, the Reach. There is an upcoming update that will see the completion of the entire Reach, which I hope comes this year. So at the moment, playable area is relatively small since it's only a part of a single hold, especially compared to, let's say, Tamriel Rebuild's map, which is already about halfway done. However, as we're gonna see, even with such a limited area, there's a ton of content and a lot to talk about. Plus, it gives us an insight into the future of this mod. And secondly, I'm in no way affiliated with the Project Tamriel or any other modding team. I don't have any inside information and everything I'm about to talk about comes from me simply playing the mod. So this will be my honest, subjective opinion and nothing more and nothing less. With that said, my name is Alec and thank you for watching. Let's give a little background on the project Tamriel. You see, Morrowind community has two ongoing massive modding projects. Tamriel Rebuilt, focused on finishing the province of Morrowind, and Project Tamriel, which is more of a collection of collaborative, fan-based modding projects working together to create the rest of Tamriel. In other words, with these two teams combined, the grand plan is having an entire continent of Tamriel playable in Morrowind's engine. Obviously, rather ambitious goal. And Skyrim Home of the Nords is, along with Province Cyrodiil, one of the two main active teams within Project Tamriel. So yeah, currently only Skyrim and Cyrodiil are being actively developed. And just for the record, and to avoid any confusion, there's also a similar massive project for TS5 called Beyond Skyrim, which does the same but in Skyrim's engine and set in official Skyrim's timeline. Now, because of that, some may ask why even bothering with a 20 plus year old game with outdated engine, especially since, as we mentioned, there are mods that do the same with Skyrim, in a more modern, more approachable engine. And I think that the answer is simply because Morrowind and Skyrim provide a drastically different Elder Scrolls experience, even if they are set in the same universe. For many, especially older Elder Scrolls fans, Morrowind offers something both Oblivion and Skyrim fail to deliver. And defining that something can be tricky. It's a certain depth and role-playing experience set in a world filled with rich, bizarre lore. As I play Morrowind for the first time, I remember wanting to see the rest of Tamriel, even before Skyrim and Oblivion came out. I wanted more of this truly unique experience expanded onto other provinces, especially after hearing about them in game dialogues. Wealth beyond measure, Outlander. And this leads me to another point. You see, throughout the years, with each new Elder Scrolls installment, Bethesda made a soft reboot, bringing certain changes to Tamriel. So by the time Elder Scrolls V came out, Skyrim's scene in the game was somewhat different from the one described in old lore. And same goes for Cyrodiil. Most notably, prior to Oblivion, Cyrodiil was described as a vast jungle, only to be suddenly switched to a pastoral European fantasy setting as seen in the Elder Scrolls IV. I actually don't mind some of these changes, 
like replacing a tropical jungle with a more mild, temperate woodland, which became synonymous with Cyrodiil anyways. I was more disappointed in the failure to portray Imperial and Nord lore as deep and intriguing as Bethesda did for Dunmer in Morrowind. For example, Cyrodiilic or Imperial culture is actually quite interesting and can be equally bizarre and complex as the one seen in Morrowind. Just because Imperials are humans, it doesn't make them boring. And something similar happened to Skyrim. Hmm? Now, I'm not here to bash Oblivion and especially Skyrim. For the past 10 years, I've spent thousands of hours playing Skyrim and I love the game for what it is, a fun, action-oriented power fantasy set in Elder Scrolls universe. So it's not that I hate Skyrim, in fact, I actually really love it. It just didn't feel weird and complex enough compared to Morrowind. And ultimately, I think that mods like this one are made for people who, let's say, want to see more of this side of Elder Scrolls universe. Nords were always my favorite race and Skyrim one place I always wanted to see. My very first Elder Scrolls character was an axe-wielding Nord barbarian in Morrowind. And for years, all I wanted was being able to one day visit Skyrim primeval arctic home of these loud, violent, mead-loving warriors. Nords in Morrowind were portrayed with so much character, mystique, and it almost made them superhuman. Seen any elves? <laughs> So when TS5 came out, let's just say that there was some room for improvement. And again, mostly in lore department. To me, it looked good enough and sounded amazing. It's just that I wanted more enchantment, depth. More of that old lore that made Morrowind so memorable. And focusing on old lore is exactly what separates Tamriel Rebuilt and Project Tamriel from not only newer Elder Scrolls titles, but also newer modding projects like Beyond Skyrim, the vision of building Tamriel as Bethesda would during the Morrowind era. This Tamriel is both more mythical and haunting. There's a darker, mystical undertone to it. Cyrodiil's Heartland, for example, remains a large jungle inhabited with strange creatures, including different kinds of dragons. And Skyrim is an icy wasteland divided into semi-independent kingdoms and still largely in tune with ancient totemic at Moran traditions. Old lore isn't only found within classic games prior to Oblivion and in early pocket guides, but it's also given by original developers who in early days used to participate in online forums discussing various lore topics. So same people responsible for making Morrowind and previous titles would expand on their ideas providing further insights on specific topics. And over the years, sites like Imperial Library would compile entire tomes of these lore fragments, naming them obscure texts. And to me, they were always part of the official lore, unless stated otherwise by the author. Since, well, they were written by same people who created the Elder Scrolls universe. And both Tamriel Rebuilt and Project Tamriel used these so-called obscure texts as inspirations to fill in their vast worlds with more of that recognizable alien Elder Scrolls lore. In any case, I hope that everything said so far offered enough explanation as to why a projects like Tamriel Rebuilt and Project Tamriel needed and what makes them unique. With that said, let's take a look at what Skyrim Home of the Nords has to offer so far. Again, bear in mind that there's only a small playable area set in the western end of Skyrim, known as the Reach. And ironically, Reach can be considered the least Skyrim looking region of Skyrim. The first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire considers the Reach by far the most cosmopolitan of the holds of Skyrim. And it goes on to say, the Reach could be mistaken for one of the petty kingdoms of High Rock. It is full of Bretons, Redguards, Cyrodiils, Elves of all stripes, and even a few misplaced Khajiits. Seen any elves? <laughs> Current playable map is dominated by two large cities, Kart Waston and Dragonstar, and is divided into several distinct regions. For example, north of Kartvastan lies a dangerous Warngod forest, and the Juradok highlands surrounding Dragonstar are filled with many mesas, misty canyons and old forgotten pathways carved through the rocky green terrain. And on top of that, ancient Dairani ruins dot the region, often occupied by native Reachmen performing strange forbidden rituals. Something I was really looking forward to seeing was the general political situation of Skyrim. It may come strange since that's one aspect I don't really care about in video games, but 
We gotta remember, one of the strongest attributes of Morrowind is the political hierarchy, the complex portrayal of governing bodies. We have in Morrowind so many layers of various governing structures, factions, ideas, all kinda meshed together creating a very dynamic, unstable setting that feels fun to explore. I honestly didn't expect that level of complexity in Skyrim, at least not yet. However, I was pleasantly surprised to discover a region filled with rather dynamic political situation full of conflicts. But then again, we are talking about Skyrim, how could it be boring? Luckily, Tamriel Rebuilt and Project Tamriel also follow Bethesda's older, now largely abandoned worldbuilding framework that is heavily based and influenced by political struggle, religion and history. Their worlds are not all about world-saving larger-than-life heroes. What I'm trying to say is that all the provinces in these mods focus on the harsh reality of the world that exists outside of players' influence. For instance, in Elder Scrolls V, Factions barely matter in any way, they don't seem to hold any true power, nor do they have any major consequence on the overall storyline, even including two main opposing sides, the Empire and Stormcloaks. Protagonist is free to join any faction or none of them, as it simply doesn't matter. World is nothing but player's personal playground, free to explore and enjoy. Protagonist's godlike status is simply above and beyond the consequences of daily politics. And again, this is perfectly fine for an action-oriented power fantasy with the emphasis on the character-driven narrative. Skyrim Home of the Nords thus strictly follows an old Bethesda logic of painting a helpless, deeply scarred world in perpetual state of agony, with the protagonist sort of carefully navigating through it, avoiding its cold, bitter winds with every careful step. Sure, both Oblivion and Skyrim threw the player in the middle of a world-ending apocalyptic scenario, yet in those games at no point I felt existential dread or insignificance. Alduin was just another dragon waiting to be slain. In later Elder Scrolls games, World openly recognizes and salutes players' special heroic status. Morrowind, on the contrary, did all the opposite. It made us unwanted and denied of any true recognition and glory. So, coming to the far western corner of third era Skyrim, we feel thrown into a conflict that is beyond our control, and it feels great. There's little to no consequence of us being this prophesized Nerevarine. Local Nords would at best laugh at the very sound of that name. Skyrim Home of the Nords portrays Reach as a land still in process of healing from a devastating war of Bendarmak. War may have ended 30 years ago, but the land is still largely in ruins. All throughout the Reach, we uncover burned down settlements, now randomly occupied by scavengers from all walks of life. Bandits, wild beasts, raiding goblin clans descended from the Dragontail Mountains, or even desolate villages haunted by vengeful ghosts of former residents. During the war, Skyrim invaded and claimed many miles of the eastern parts of Hammerfell and High Rock, which explains why this Skyrim stretches further east than the one seen in TS5. Central hub of this newly acclaimed territory is definitely the city of Dragonstar, now split into eastern and western sections and each with their own government. Eastern part is ruled by the Nords, western by crowns, traditional nobles of Redcard society, and between them a literal wall slicing the city of Dragonstar into two equal halves, manned by few imperial guards who barely manage to maintain the peace. Needless to say, there's a tension in the air as both sides are more than ready for another open war, especially Red Guards eagerly waiting to reclaim their lost territory. On top of that, there's a rumor of Imperial legions pulling out troops since, as we know, there's a trouble brewing back in the Imperial city. And if the legion abandons the garrison in Dragonstar, another war is almost certain. By the way, the war of the Bandar Mak was in the plot of the 2004 spin-off game The Elder Scrolls Travels. Shadow of Key. This game may be obscure, but some of its lore is even mentioned by Master Nalot in Skyrim. And Skyrim Home of the Nords does a great job seamlessly blending all this pre-Morrowind, more obscure lore with the present time. And speaking of Shadow of Key, Wormmouths, one of the most common hostile creatures encountered in these parts of Skyrim, are also from that game. Alright, let's cover some of the major players in this complex geopolitical landscape. 
We obviously have Nords, represented through the Kingdom of Reach, with a seat in Markarth's side. In fact, the entire province of Skyrim, known also as Fatherland of the Man, isn't really a unified monarchy. It's comprised of nine, more or less, autonomous kingdoms. Each kingdom is ruled by a king, while High King holds greatest authority, at least in theory. In reality, with Skyrim being ever so unstable and fragmented, High King is more of a symbolic authority due to ancient Nord custom. So we have nine kings and beneath them are Jarls, ruling over Jarldoms. Many Jarls can trace their heritage to 500 companions and are usually chosen by the king. Beneath Jarls are Thanes, minor nobles that sometimes preside over towns and villages. And that's pretty much it when it comes to Skyrim's political hierarchy. Current ruler of the Reach is King Barda, seated in the Markarth side, so we will get to meet him in a future update. We do meet Jarl Yona in Dragonstar East, as well as Thane Formir the Voiceful, a war veteran ruling over Karth Vastan. There are also notable Nord clans like Firehand, Boar Snout, and a personal favorite, Bear Clan. And with Dragonstar West being technically in Hammerfell, we do see some of the Red Card culture as well. It's ruled by the crowns, traditional nobles of Redgar society who want nothing else but to drive the Nords away. Empire is present but as always spread too thin and barely capable of keeping the peace between the warring kingdoms. They have their standard forts, legal offices and factions but I'd say that their presence in the reach is minimized to the point of almost being insignificant. And then they are the mysterious Reachmen, also known as the Witchmen of High Rock. Most of the fans will probably recognize this faction as Forsworn, a hostile group of primitive natives in TS5. However, Forsworn are only a faction of surviving Reachmen founded after the Markarth incident, much later in the Fourth Era. They may not be as influential as Nords or Redguards, but their presence should not be ignored. Reachmen camps dotted Druadoc Highlands often situated near the Dareni ruins or abandoned forts. Some camps are openly hostile, some more welcoming to foreigners. Their society is ruled by wise witch matriarchs that sometimes corrupt or evolve into hag ravens. And while most of the rich men prefer living outside a so-called civilized space, there are some who settle down as small-time traders in the cities. Now, I'm not very familiar with their lore, and I think that their secrecy and mystique makes them more interesting. We do know that there are in total 7 Reachmen tribes in Skyrim, and they are considered mostly Breton in origin, while also having Orcs, Altmer, Redguards, and even Nords as their ancestors as well, which is why they are considered a mongrel race by all the others. Rich men are in fact in a very interesting liminal position, and by that I mean that they are occupying this vague cultural space between. In a land that is already wild and primitive, they are the wild and primitive ones. Rich men are the boogeyman of western Skyrim, face-painted savage highlanders imbued with primitive folk magic, raiding villages and kidnapping children from farms. And yes, rumors of rich men kidnapping children can be heard in towns, whether they're true or not. Locals would even blame rich men and their cursed dark magic for bad weather, floods, poor harvest, or pretty much any misfortune. I'll also just add that in game they had their own custom race and remind me a lot of human orcs. Again, as I said, they may not have a strong presence as neighboring Nord or Redguard kingdoms, but they are natives, claiming the ownership over these lands. I'm pretty sure we will be introduced to more of their lore with the coming expansion as their tribes spread all across the western Skyrim. In a way, they are to Bretons what Ashlanders are to Dunmer, although I admit this is a very crude generalization. They also bring in a lot of Celtic folk elements mixed in with the dark magic, witchcraft and that raw Bronze Age prehistoric aesthetics. Anyhow, I think that it'll be very interesting to learn more about the rich men and their culture, since I believe that Bethesda missed its chance with the Forsworn to delve into that classic deep and bizarre lore territory. And in case you wondered, yes, there are hag ravens, and they look terrifying. Well, you've won this round. I mentioned rich men reminding me of human orcs, so I should mention that there is an orcish presence as well, although quite small. Orsinium, the great western city-state of the Orcs, is at this point a free independent kingdom, although not recognized as a full province by the Emperor. 
We meet a small group of orcs on a diplomatic mission in Dragonstar. As Orsinium borders Hammerfell territory to the south, they seem to be raided by a party of Redguard cultists and let's just say things went pretty nasty. All in all, Skyrim home of the Nords, just like Morrowind, offers plenty of spicy regional politics and I'm very excited to see where this takes us, as we have rest of Skyrim to uncover and with it there will be even more politics, more layers of diplomacy. In terms of settlements, Skyrim Home of the Nords is on pair with Tamriel Rebuilt. Towns are upscaled compared to vanilla game, both in terms of size and detail, but in a tasteful, acceptable manner. Kartvasten is the largest city in the reach and I'd say it's roughly equivalent to Balmora. Now, some may find this surprising as Kartvasten in TS5 is but a small mining village with three houses. However, early maps of Skyrim clearly portray Kartvasten as Reach's largest and the most important city. Markart is here called Markart Side and is somewhat smaller in size, although it's still a home to King Barda. I'm also very excited to see this version of Markart as it will offer quite a different looking city. As we all know, in TS5 it's housed in a large Dwemer city, yet Dwemer ruins are absent from Skyrim in this timeline, at least absent from Reach and replaced by Dairani ruins. So this version of Markart will have a Dairani tower as the king's home called Elfstone Keep. Kartvasten was in fact also recaptured by the Nords in the war 30 years ago, together with Dragonstar after centuries of Redguard rule. So ownership over the cities kinda goes back and forth between Nords and Redguards. And Kartvasten actually feels like a busy market city, with horse stables outside the gates, docks, commercial district populated with all sorts of traders, richly decorated palace. My free estimate is that Kartvasten, together with people from the outskirts, hosts a few hundred NPCs. On the other hand, Dragonstar offers even more of a unique blend of Redguard and Nord culture. We already talked about Dragonstar being divided into eastern and western half, ruled by Redguards and Nords. And roaming through this city definitely feels like being in Hammerfell or perhaps even High Rock. Architecture wise, both cities are, not surprisingly, built in a more western than Nord style. And I have to add, they are fun to explore filled with many interesting characters, minor quests and items. For Morrowind and its dated engine known for mainly static world space, they feel very much alive and vibrant. Now there is also a smaller, typical Norse settlement called Kartgard, which means Kart's Guard. It's located north of Kartvesten and deep within Vortgan Forest and it's a home to a notorious bear clan. And as much as I loved urban exploring large cities and learning about the big politics, it's these small remote settlements like Kartgad that captivate me the most. As I explored the vast wild regions of the Reach, far from the urban areas, there was a constant feeling of being in a strange fantasy world that blends medieval and early western aesthetics. I'm pretty sure it was only my wild imagination, but I couldn't help myself feeling like I'm in a wild west frontier-like world where swords and low magic replaced guns and dynamite. Kartgad's simple wooden structures and surrounding dense forest reminded me of certain Italian comics I used to read, which blended previously mentioned genres. And in general, Elder Scrolls universe was, at least to me, always characterized by a strong anachronistic dimension. Certain locations in TS5 like Riverwood and Falkrit affected me in the same way, painting a world of a frontier, a solitude, struggle, wildness and raw adventure. In any case, as we said, Kartgad is home to Bear Clan. And to me, they are one of the most interesting groups of Nords encountered so far. And what makes these guys special? Well, they are an extremely isolate, wild Nords that own Kartgad and the surrounding Warngad forest. Think of the true Nords and then extreme version of that. <laughs> Bears pretty much act on their own and are in the bad terms even with the King Barda. And besides Kartgad, they also own a Blood Paw hunting lodge found even deeper into the woods. For some reason, discovering the Blood Paw hunting lodge hidden behind the trees was one of the most memorable moments for me. Some locals think of the bears are mere brigands and thugs, while clan members see themselves as brave guardians of the frontier, protectors of not only Warngad Forest, but Skyrim itself. So this toothpaste stuff, what's it for? 
fixing old teeth. They are in constant war with the surrounding Richmond tribes and don't shy away from kidnapping random travelers, especially if they happen to be elves. As a matter of fact, bears lived in isolation from the rest of the Nords deep in this woods for such a long time that apparently their physical appearance changed. And when they were accused of mixing with the Richmen, their sworn enemies, they argued back that their changed appearance was only due to interbreeding. Honestly, it's these local stories that make this world feel so alive and, dare I say, realistic. But seriously, I'd love to see more of this wild, elemental side of Nordic culture, especially in other remote regions of Skyrim. If I remember correctly, early depictions of Skyrim mention Nords of distant North as almost magical and elemental, more in tune with their Atmoran origin, something similar to Berserkers and Frost Witches of Solstheim. I'd definitely love to see this side of Nords more explored. Since I mentioned it so many times, let's talk about the Worngan Forest for a bit. It stretches between Kartvasten and Markart's side and it's obviously gorgeous, although quite dangerous as well. I believe it's the largest forest region that I got to explore in any Morrowind related mod, including Tamriel Rebuilt. It probably feels larger than it actually is, thanks to a detailed vertical landscaping. And without the use of a world map, it's quite easy to lose direction and I'm proud to say it happened to me more than once. Yet forest never feels repetitive and boring as it's filled with unique landmarks and unexpected inhabitants. There are abandoned lodges, caves, camps, spectacular views. Everywhere you turn, there's something to draw your attention. It's also full of critters and diverse enemies. I easily spent hours hiking through and every time I thought I saw everything, I'd find something new. And we can expect a few more large or perhaps even larger forests in Skyrim. So I'm very excited to one day explore Falkreath, Halffinger and Riften, as I believe that those regions will also be heavily forested. There's no true Elder Scrolls experience without dungeon diving and exploring some of the Tamriel's ancient ruins. One of the major differences between this mod and TS5 is the absence of Dwemer ruins. I did some research and I believe that only Dwemer ruins that we ever gonna see in Skyrim will be limited to the very eastern border with Morrowind. And once again, I'm glad they decided to make this change since in return we get to explore ruins of a totally new culture. And also, I believe we had plenty of all things Dwemer in Vanilla and Tamriel rebuilt. With that said, and risking to sound like a total fanboy, I believe that Dairani ruins are some of the most aesthetically pleasing ruins in Elder Scrolls series. They are simply breathtaking, even from afar. And this shouldn't come to surprise considering that Dairani were the very elite of their times. So these are not some ancient rusty factories or asymmetrical temples to Daedric gods. Dairani were, and probably still are, a wealthy aristocratic clan of the High Elves. Very ancient and likened to the famous Renaissance Medici family by the developer Ted Peterson. Dairani were at the very pinnacle of their society, masters of all things arcane, and their grand towers, illuminated up to this day with the magical lights, were home to most accomplished wizards. Today, Dairani ruins serve as mere silent reminders of Tamriel's rich and rather elegant antiquity. Stylistically, I'd say they are somewhere halfway between the Dwemer and Eyelids, and Dairani themselves are of course nowhere to be found. Instead, these ruins are home to hostile bandits, primitive Reachmen tribes, reclusive mystics in search of ancient tomes of knowledge, and hordes of summoned Daedra wandering through its darkest corners. In short, they are still full of danger, as expected, but offer a very fun dungeon diving experience and a nice reward. For example, I encountered unique named Daedric mini-bosses in richly decorated living quarters of some long dead mighty sorcerer. However, one of my favorite things when it comes to the Reni was collecting their really elegantly designed clutter. Anything from simple plates to keys, forks and spoons, weapons and even armor. As I explored the ruins, all I could think about was how these small simple items would look so exotic in my home back on Wardenfell. Skyrim Home of the Nords naturally offers plenty of new enemies to fight as well as plants to harvest. I already mentioned the wormmouths, bipedal reptiles related to guars, alets and kagutis that we all know and love from vanilla game. They look similar yet also unique enough, adding to Skyrim some of that Morrowind-like familiarity. 
However, my favorite creature so far has to be the Crete Minotaur. Once I encountered were quite challenging, walking around level 25 and with health pool of 450. These minotaurs look very bestial and at first, from a distance, I thought they were werewolves. Now, name Crete could mean that there will be also some other variants, but I could be wrong. So far, I only encountered this type. Also, their name probably reveals their origin from Falkrit, as there is a region called Crete Dale, north of the city of Falkrit. But interestingly enough, the sound Crete also reminds me of an island of Crete, home of the mythical Minotaur in ancient Greek legend. So it's a nice little wordplay as well. And speaking of Minotaurs, I truly hope that they'll play a larger role or at least have a more significant presence once the map is expanded to the south, especially to Falkreet and Riften. They will most definitely be explored in details in Province Cyrodiil, since Minotaurs have some of the most interesting and bizarre lore in Cyrodiil, so we could see some of it spill into the neighboring territories of Skyrim. I'd personally love to see some social hierarchy and traces of Minotaur culture, no matter how primitive and ancient, maybe even finding some unique named ones. I know that Minotaur may seem like a rather generic fantasy creatures, but Elder Scrolls made them so interesting, especially once you learn about their origin and role in the early human empire. Another notable enemies are Hag Ravens. So far, I encountered only a couple of them and what I especially love is that they were all named and not just generic enemies. This one in particular was not as tough as I feared, being only level 15 and with 180 points of health and magic. She was however surrounded by a group of Reachmen outcasts, so overall our encounter was rather epic. Cave trolls are very similar to the ones in TS5, very ape-like and tough, especially when in groups. Each has 300 health points, so it takes a while to take them down. There are probably going to be other variants like Ice Troll, but we'll see. One of the most bizarre looking enemies are definitely kobolds. They are found freely roaming through countryside and aren't that challenging. To me, they seem to be yet another variation of goblins and lore-wise, kobolds in particular are very obscure, being mentioned in some dialogues in the very first Elder Scrolls game, Arena. They have a very medieval European fantasy design, at least that's what I get from them, reminding me of creatures found in standard Dungeons and Dragons setting. Spike worms are also taken from Shadow Key and, as the name suggests, they are overgrown worms with spikes. They are mostly found deep in caves and more rarely in the open. And just like kobolds, they are not dangerous but add much needed variety to Skyrim's bestiary. Reach also has its own version of Cliff Racer, although somewhat less annoying, called Snow Ray. They really left an impression on me upon our first encounter, looking very alien while circling and gliding around the Rennie Towers. And in case you wondered, yes, they are yet another creature borrowed from Shadow Key. One of the toughest enemies so far was the Draugr Lord, found in where else but in the Nord Barrow. This one here was level 30 with 500 health points. And naturally, there are also plenty of bears, wolves, boars, spriggans, vampires, rats, giant spiders, and other creatures expected to be found in this part of Tamriel. As for the plant life, even though I rarely delve into alchemy, I found myself enjoying discovering new plants, and there's quite a few of them. Besides all the flowers, I was mostly excited to see apple trees. Yep, we finally know where all those fresh apples in Skyrim come from, as there are many rather charming apple orchards around the cities. I can't even express how much fun I had exploring 3rd era Skyrim and how it made me eager for a future update. As a huge fan of Tamriel Rebuilt, it felt great experiencing another province that was given the same amount of care and love. There are many, many fun small details that I haven't even covered today. For example, the masterfully designed Nordic barrows, populated with draugrs and large spiders, and how they appropriately contain ancient Nordic coins instead of modern day septums. Overall, the team behind the mod is building a world that feels incredibly alive, a world populated by characters with stories to tell, landscape that is both spectacular and menacing. The way I experience Skyrim Home of the Nords is that it's a separate game and in many ways it can be played on its own. All you have to do is pay for a long boat trip to Skyrim, a new adventure offering a totally different experience from the alien and ashen land of Morrowind 
can begin. It doesn't take anything away from the original game, but it adds so much, and if anything, it upscales the world to a much greater proportion. On top of that, Skyrim Home of the Nords feels like a perfect medieval low fantasy RPG with human towns, forests and knights. At times it reminds me of Oblivion and certain areas are clearly inspired by The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Developers wisely combine all the best elements from both old, obscure games like Shadow Key and Arena with the newer ones, concluding with Skyrim, to create what is in many ways a perfect Elder Scrolls experience. As I said, I'm eagerly awaiting coming update and chance to explore the entire reach. After that, who knows? I believe that the next playable hold will be Half Finger, since it's on the northern border and it will also see the rest of the Reachman tribes that populate the northwestern areas, and that way developers could wrap up this specific western Skyrim's arc. Judging from some of the concept art and ideas for future regions, Skyrim is only going to get even more fascinating. There will be islands to the north, mainly the mysterious Ross Cray, and few smaller ones. There will be everyone's favorite giants with their own fleshed out society. I also saw a location of a blood dome temple in Falkreath, which is tied to one of my favorite obscure minor factions. Red Dome Templars. I spoke about them a bit in my video on Tamriel Rebuild's 5 interesting NPCs. So things are looking great, as I love to say Morrowind is here to stay, and it's mostly thanks to all these wonderful teams of developers. So stay tuned as I'm going to cover more of the third era Skyrim lore in the future, but for now thank you all for watching and I'll see you very soon. Seen any elves? <laughs>